We are pleased to welcome into the studio a person I mean, I feel who, like we should do like an intro. An you intro. Know? I well, because this well, is a big something. deal. Well, it know? is a big deal. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, but this is also somebody that that everybody knows, too. This isn't like an unknown person. Well, I'm going to share a wonderful little short story with okay. Tom when he comes in, because he's one of the reasons why um, I really, you know, I, I, I really went in with this. Like I, I was always interested in politics. I mean, I majored in political science at Rutgers and, you know, I always found it to be fascinating, but Tom was the first person who I really listened to when Bernie, when nobody was talking about Bernie. I only knew about Bernie because he used to go on Bill Maher's show, but I knew he was a man of integrity and I knew he cared. And when Tom started talking about him on his show, The Big Picture, I thought, you know what? Anyone who thinks that this is impossible just isn't paying attention. And then eventually, and I'll, I'll follow up that story when I bring Tom in, but for those of you who may be new to the show, maybe into progressive politics, and remember, hit the like button, subscribe, share this right now, because we're about to go live. We're going to be bringing on Tom Hartman, and he is, and this is from the back of the new book, four-time winner of the Project Censored Award, and I love Project Censored for people who don't know that. That is an awesome thing. And a New York Times bestselling author of 32 books. That's amazing. 32? 32. And America's oh. number one progressive talk radio show host. And that's very important because there's not enough of us. That's for sure. Welcome, Tom. Hi. Hey, great to see you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So I want you to know, I read this. I did. I read it. You sent it to me. I read it. Bless and you. I even took, I even took copious notes. I have notes in the margins. Like I kind of went back to law school, I highlighter and everything. So, but mm -hmm. If you would just talk a little bit about what was the impetus. I mean, obviously this is part, I mean, I've seen you have like a series of similar type books, but the impetus of this and um, how this came about this particular one. Sure. Well, the series is about drilling down in particular parts of our history that should inform modern day debates and dialogues. Um, but because we lack the historical context, our 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 politics get really really badly confused like you know the second amendment the first book was about the second amendment it was you know like the, the second amendment was written the way it was to preserve the slave patrols in virginia uh -oh. and south carolina uh -oh, nobody you. knows that you know and and, and and so you have to start at the beginning so that's that's why i'm doing the series but this particular one the last one was on monopoly monopoly is when economic power is concentrated in a small number of hands and they use it to block competition out of the marketplace Oligarchy is the same thing only in the political sphere. It's when a small number of very powerful people, typically because they're very wealthy, uh, seize control of the political system of a nation or of a state or even a region um, and essentially declare themselves oligarchs. I mean, I think that for anybody who's been paying attention, to it's clear that we're there. I mean, yeah. we're there, we've been there for a while, we've been floating around in it. Um, I, and it was really great the way you broke down because I knew this was happening and I knew it went back to the Reaganish time. I knew that there was, that was where things went awry, but the way you break it down and how it's so cyclical is really, I think, extremely important because I think that's how we kind of can learn like how this is going to play out and what we can do. So if you would like, you, you'll do a better job talking about, um, what the, I mean, you say three, there's been like three, this is like, we're in our third cycle as a, as a nation. And if you could just talk about um, how that is and how the generations, um, how far apart it is and how this generally works. Sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, the, you know, we fought a, a, a revolutionary war against yeah. an oligarchy. It, they call themselves a monarchy. That's an oligarchy with a DNA thread through it, but it's oligarchy. Um, and then in the 1830s, because of the invention of the cotton gin, which made uh, any plantation that could afford a cotton gin literally 50 times more efficient at carding and cleaning cotton than any of the small ones. So they were able to wipe out their competition and turn the South into a, into a police state oligarchy in about 30 years between 1825 roughly and 1860 or, 18, or eight, yeah, 1860. Um, which led to the Civil War. We and then you know they, they declared war on us in part because that democracy up north was causing rabble down south. Uh, you know, particularly people who had uh, come over as indentured Irishmen and and Scots to to start to rebel. In addition to the slave rebellions that were undergoing, um, and so you know <laughs> I thought they had to take us out. We beat that those oligarchs. Then the oligarchs rose again through the Industrial Revolution, another technological shift that brought it about. 
And Franklin Roosevelt took them on. He said, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. And now we're in this third phase, which really began in its starkest form uh, with the election of Ronald Reagan. It started uh, arguably a decade before that. And it was warned about three decades before that. And I don't know how much detail you want me to get into about how we got to there, but we can come back to that. You, you yeah, mentioned I mean, the generational. Just generally, thing. yeah, like how it's this far apart and how we're seeing it as a cycle. Sure. And then I have a follow up to that. So, yeah, talk about sure. the rate yeah, starting well, to break. Um, Strauss and Howe wrote a book called The Fourth Turning, in which they laid this out in, in considerable detail. And I, I, to some extent in the book, you know, point to that. Um, and what they pointed out is that there are typically four generations that repeat themselves constantly forever. Um, just to pick one particular random place, let's, let's start with a generation that experiences a, a, a Great Depression and a war. Um, that generation, as a consequence of their experience growing up through that, will produce offspring, uh, the next generation, um, uh, you know, this, excuse me, this generation with the parents, their children growing up through that, they become the generation that are the quiet, hard workers, the archetype of the 1950s, the greatest generation. Um, they, they put their nose down, they don't complain, they get the job done, they, they loyally join, you know, the draft when the World War II is declared, et cetera. That generation, because of their, you know, persistence like that, their children, are growing up in a world that's functional and orderly and structured and hey, that's boring and no fun. And so their children tend to be the ones that are saying, you know, my parents worked their asses off and what did they get for it? You know, a house in the suburbs, really? I want, you know, spiritual fulfillment. And so that this third generation will literally break with ways of the past, a socially very revolutionary generation, and they tend to go off in spiritual and political searches. And that's the 60s and 70s. And then that generation produces a generation of children who, again, are looking at their parents and saying, you know, mom and dad sat and uh, meditated three hours a day and it didn't do a damn thing for them. Um, I want to get rich, you know, and, and I'm concerned about security and safety. So and then that fourth generation will go so excessive. Uh, trying to get rich, trying, you know, to, uh, trying to create a really roaring economy. They'll go so excessive that they crash the economy into a depression, which inevitably will lead to a war. And boom, we're back to the fourth, you know, the the fourth turn. Yeah. Stress, and I'll call it. And each generation is 20 years, you know. A gen and so that's an 80 year cycle. And it's real interesting that 80 years ago was the end of World War Two and and, you know, kind of the the end of the Great Depression era. 80 years before that was the Civil War or the right. end of the Civil War. 80 years before that was the Revolutionary War. And in, in Strauss and Howe's books, they take it back to the 1500s every 80 years. And you can see each one of these four generations. If that was your question, they, you know, I talk about that. In the book. <clears throat> yeah, no, and it's it's great. And I, I love that because it is so cyclical and we see it. The only difference is we have greater technology as we move along. Yeah. So we have that we've we've perf and we've perfected the ways of hurting each other uh, much better and you know than we had. But what's interesting is it seems like the first time and the second time, the first time it was brought to an end by the by the Civil War, and yeah. the second time it was brought to the end by legislation by the by the New Deal, and well, so and also by the Great I, I, that woke the Great people Depression. the hell up which made it possible. But it wasn't, it wasn't a war that ended it. It, it was, it, and so the question is, can we do that again as opposed to having another civil war? Yeah, in other words, take uh, if, if Hitler hadn't come along, we might not have had World War II and we might not have had a war, in which case it would have yeah. been really good outcome. And, well, that, and, was, right. that wasn't because of our oligarchy in particular. There were other factors. Correct. That's absolutely correct. And 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 Strauss and Howe actually kind of have a debate about this. And there's a whole debate that's grown up around this whole concept of these 80 year cycles. And then also there are 50 year business cycles that fit within those or not within them, but kind of happen at the same time. And we're about 50 years out from, you know, the, the Powell memo in 1971. Um, and so we may be time, it may be time for a, another turn in that too, although I don't get into that in this book. But there's a big debate about whether depressions inevitably lead to wars. And, uh, you know, there, there's a three out of four times, certainly they do. 
um, uh, you know, the French and Indian Wars, the the War of the Roses. I mean, you know, they they those are in those cycles that Strauss and Howe point to. But I don't, I you know, I'm not a real scholar of those of the cycles of history in that regard. So I I I can't offer a definitive answer. We're speaking with Tom Hartman of the Tom Hartman Show, his new book, The Hidden History of American Oligarchy. Tom, we don't really have what I would think is an anti-war movement, uh, especially in Congress right now, but I do think there is a growing progressive movement, whether it's Cori Bush, AOC, Jamal Bowman, Ro Khanna, Marie Newman. There's obviously several, um, I'm sure, potential <clears throat> uh, new individuals who may hopefully uh, throw their hat in the ring for 2022 and beyond. How important is it to really develop that um, that grassroots movement that right now seems to be, you know, obviously a lot of people are still, you know, licking their wounds from what happened to Bernie. And obviously right now, um, you know, the, the, the trail that's been left by Trump um, and Lord knows how long that's going to take to clean up. Uh, but I think right now the, the desperation is really um, it's, it's, it's at a boiling point, especially when it comes to the survival checks and not having universal health care. So I'd like to know from your perspective, um, seeing what you've seen over the years, how important it is right now to really develop that grassroots movement that may be there, but doesn't seem, it seems more like a rudderless ship right now. If we are not successful in producing genuine progressive change, and let's be very clear, every public opinion survey for the last 20 years shows that everything that Bernie ran on is wanted by a majority of Americans, more than 50% of Americans, and, and these days more than 80%, from free college to a national health care system to uh, a government guarantee of a job if, if uh, the private sector is in collapse. Um, you know, to a higher minimum wage, to enhance union rights. These are not radical positions. This is where America is at. And uh, the, one of the reasons I wrote this book is because it's obvious we are in an oligarchy for, it's been about 20 years, according to Gillens and Page's research, since what the average person wants gets translated into legislation. You know, back before Reagan, what people wanted, we turned into law. We create, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, long-term unemployment, uh, housing assistance, Pell Grants for college. I mean, I could give you a list of 100 things long that people wanted and legislators turned into law in between 1950 you know, and, well, you can go back to the 30s even, you know, Social Security and 1980. But starting in 1980, really, that just came to a screeching halt. And now it's only what the billionaires want. That's why the only legislative accomplishment of the Trump administration was a $2 trillion tax cut for billionaires. So the problem with this is that when people figure out that their elected officials are ignoring them, that they're not getting what they want. And like I said, this has been going on for 20 years. That, In other words, when people figure out that they're in an oligarchy, oligarchies are extraordinarily unstable political systems. They go, they, they very rarely last more than a single generation, rather longer than 20 years. And when they change, they change in one of two directions. Either the people take out the oligarchs or take down the oligarchs or the oligarchy, let's say, as happened with the Civil War and has happened with Franklin Roosevelt's war on what he referred to as the economic royalists. Or the oligarchs have amassed so much power that they look around and they say, holy crap, these people are trying to take us down we're going to pass some laws and we're going to, and, and basically the country turns into a police state. And this is what you saw happen to the new democracy of Russia. This is what you see happening right now in Hungary, which used to be a fully integrated European <laughs> Union uh, country. Um, we're seeing it in Brazil right now with Bolsonaro. We're seeing it in the Philippines um, with Duterte. Uh, I, I mean, I, pick your example. Uh, it's happening in Poland with Duda right now, in Turkey with, with uh, what's his name? Um, Yet anyway, <laughs> you get my point. Yeah. And so Trump was taking us on this path right smack dab into police state. I mean, that was absolutely the direction he was going. And there's no doubt in my mind that you and I would probably be in jail right now or maybe a year or two from now if he had been able to hold power. Because when you look at the track of these oligarchs, as they're going through the process of seizing control of a democracy and turning it into an oligarchy, they begin trashing the press. And when they finally flip it into a police state, the first people they imprison are the press and, 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 and murder, by the way, as you can see all happening all over the world right now. It's not, it's not a safe time to be a journalist in Turkey, for example. And that's the direction they were going. So we're at this really critical point. Now, 
the one thing that will cause a large number of Americans to say, we want to go with democracy instead of a police state, is if the Biden administration and the Democratic Party can deliver on genuine progressive reforms. If they fail to do that, like Clinton failed to do it and Obama failed to do it, you're going to have a whole bunch of voters who are going to sit around. I knew a half a dozen people in, when I lived in Washington, D.C., they were all military or ex-military, who were fanatic about Bernie during the primary and all voted for Trump. You, that's what you're going to see. People are going to say, ah, to hell with them. They're all politicians. Whoever has the best line about how they're going to blow up the system, I'm going to vote for it because the system is screwed. And that and that'll just bring us President Josh Hawley or President Rick, Rick Scott or, Pres, you know, in 2024. And then somebody smarter than Donald Trump will pull the switch and that'll be the end of America. So it's in short answer to your uh, I'm sorry, I gave you a long answer, but uh, in answer right to your right. question, it's vital that progressives rise up, create and, and fill a movement, take over the Democratic Party at the local level, show up at your local Democratic Party, become a progressive, become a precinct committee person. These are the people who pick the, pick the primary candidates and write the, write the uh, party platform. And let's take over the Democratic Party broadly. I mean, we've been doing this now slowly for 20 years and we're starting to get some success. And then the last point I'll make is, the one thing that will prevent that kind of progress by the Biden administration and guarantee a Republican president in 2024 is the filibuster. If the Republicans can still exercise a veto on Joe Biden doing any of the progressive things that he and Kamala Harris are actually talking about doing. And I, I got to say, a year ago, I never in my wildest dreams would have thought I would be talking about Joe Biden this way. But in any case, if the people can't, if, if the Republicans stop him from doing those things, then, you know, we're, we're toast. We're toast. And so the, the most important thing that people can do who are listening or watching right now is call their senators at 202-224-3121, which is the main switchboard in Washington, D.C. for Congress, and just ask for your senator and just say, blow up the filibuster, especially if your senator is Joe Manchin in West Virginia or Kristen Sinema in Arizona, because they're the two who have said, we're the two Democrats who are going to hang out of the filibuster you know, to help out Mitch McConnell. Well, to, well obviously well. to help out big coal and big real estate and banking, you know, but anyway, yeah. I have a, I, well, I want to talk a little bit about media. media. We're mm -hmm. getting feedback. We're getting feedback. That's just you. Uh, I don't know if that Todd, that may have been on your end, Tom. Okay, uh -huh. try again. Okay. What's that? What I missed? No. Okay. So um, we're talking about this. I mean, there's rabid censorship going on right now. And like you were just saying, like under a fascist, um, tyrannical regime, obviously people that are speaking truth to power are going to be targeted. Um, but a bigger concern regarding the media that you do go into in this book is how it has been completely purchased by the oligarchy. And that's one of the key steps in creating their oligarchy is having control of the narrative. And so when someone like Donald Trump says, oh, that's fake news, yeah, kind of in regards to some of the stuff he's talking about, because it's very cherry picked and it's very propagandized and it's corporate talking points. And so we're in this problem where the good journalists are obviously being persecuted and the other ones are spewing corporate talking points. So, you know, how do you reconcile it? Well, and the, and the, and the last point um, that I would add to your list of, of the crimes of the media or the failures of the media is that the decisions that are made about what is going to be presented to us as news and what isn't are not based on what's important. They're based on in any, however you define the word important, they're based on what's going to get the most views, what's going to hold people's attention. If they thought they could get away with showing us cat videos all night, they'd do it, um, you know, because it's all about getting the money from the advertisers. But the reality is that you know, from the 1920s until the 19, until 1996, we had laws in place to present, prevent the consolidation of media precisely because we understood what a threat that would be. And, and you know, particularly after the uh, yellow journalism era of the late 1800s, uh, those laws actually got radically strengthened in the 1920s and 1930s as they applied to broadcasting. So that if you owned uh, a newspaper, in one particular place. You couldn't also own a radio station or a television station. If you owned a radio station, you had to live in the state. If you had a television station, you had to live in the state. There was cross ownership bans and aggregate ownership bans, and they were absolutely in place. And that all got blown up in 1996 when Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act of 96. 
and you saw this little company, Clear Channel, that that had you know a few dozen radio stations down south suddenly buy basically every consequential radio station. I mean, they they, they ended up with almost a thousand radio stations within yep. a year or two. Mm-hmm. And and what did they do with those stations? Well, it was a very conservative company. They put right wing talk shows on, you know, probably twenty percent of them. I, that's just a guess, but you know, a good chunk of them. And and then you know, the cumulus, same deal. I mean, there's there's this is this is a crisis. Media ownership in the United States. We need to relocalize media ownership, and we need to be breaking up the big media uh, uh, combines. And and let me just add a punctuation mark to this, which I don't think is in the book. Um, I think it was in the first draft. I had cut like 20,000 words out of the book. Um, but because uh, I write long and I'm talking long, I'm sorry. But, um, but uh, when Howard Dean, who was, you know, Bernie Sanders progressive, just slightly less than Bernie, but, you know, they were friends and colleagues from Vermont and we lived right down the street from them and from, from Howard. And when he was running for, for president and he was, at the top of his game, I mean, he was on the cover of Time magazine. He was in the Democratic primary. He was at the cover of Time magazine. He was at the top of the opinion polls. And Chris Matthews had him on his show on MSNBC. And, and he said uh, to Howard Dean, he said uh, they started talking about something with the economy. And Dean said something about monopolies and that monopolies were screwing up, helping screw up the economy or preventing it from growing. And Chris Matthews said, uh, well, what about media monopolies? And, and Howard Dean said, well, you should break them up. And there was this long pause and Chris says, but, you know, we're on MSNBC. We're owned by General Electric. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a media company. It's a giant combine. You know, should we be forced to spin off uh, NBC and MSNBC? And, and Howard Dean said, absolutely. It should be broken up. And I turned to my wife, to Louise, who was sitting next to me, and I said, he's toast. He's, he's completely toast. screwed. And five days later was the Dean scream, as I recall. It might have been a week later. It was in that neighborhood where they, where they took his, yeah, where they took a perfectly normal thing and just jacked the audio insanely and made it seem like he was nuts and destroyed him. Yeah. Yeah. And now he works for a pharmaceutical corporation. <laughs> I would like to, and we're speaking with Tom Hartman of the Tom Hartman Show. I'm going to put book, the book up. That's the Hidden History do. of American Oligarchy. You should definitely check it out. I would definitely say that the moment, you know, you usually, uh, you you don't know when the moment's going to happen, but I do think that the moment where everything changed in the United States, no question, was when Reagan fired the air traffic controllers who were striking. Right, in August of 1981, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, listen, he was an ex, especially during his first term, we can spend an entire day talking about what a disastrous second term Reagan had, but his first term, he was immensely popular and he was basically able to do whatever he wanted. And the day he fired those air traffic controllers and not a single union decided to walk out on the job was basically the day that labor was dead. And it was just a question of how long it was going to take. But I do think that there is an opportunity right now for that moment to go in the other direction. And that, of course, is if the Bessemer, Alabama labor workers at the Amazon facility are able to form a union. I do think that that will be the moment that changes everything for the labor movement in the United States. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, Bernie has obviously come out for it. A number of others as well have, uh, uh, too. I believe Ro Khanna has. Uh, I do think the importance of those workers forming a union against the most powerful man on earth right now, I think is could potentially be a major game changer for the labor movement in this country. What do you think about that? I think your analysis is brilliant. Uh, I, I think you're spot oh, don't on. Don't fill his head with that. Do not do that. Oh, you know, I've, I've been I've been talking up the the action down oh. in Alabama, but you know, these are these are uh, you know monster slayers. You know, Goliath slayers. Uh, yeah. They're yeah. taking down the biggest cor- the richest man in the world. You know, the biggest corporation, one of the biggest corporations in America. And if they succeed, I you know it, it hadn't occurred to me how how huge the consequences would be. But I think that your analysis is absolutely right. Reagan, when he came into office, I mean, he had basically two charges, two jobs to do. Um, the first was to dial back on the wealth of the middle class because everybody uh, on the conservative side believed that Russell Kirk's 1951 prediction that if the middle class got too wealthy, you would see society be torn apart by the forces that would be unleashed. Uh, everybody on the conservative side believed that to be true. And so Reagan had to reduce the wealth of the middle class, and, which he did. 
Um, and number two, he had to de- he wanted to defund the, the Democratic Party. The Republicans hadn't held the U.S. House of Representatives except for two years, you know, 48, 49, it, since, since 1932. I mean, you know, and, and they still didn't until 1996. You know, they had a, one, one more time. But um, he wanted they, the other thing was to rip the financial guts out of the Democratic Party. And, and in 1976 and 78, in the Buckley and Bellotti decisions, when the Supreme Court said that giving money to a politician, owning a politician, a politician in exchange for that money, giving you legislation, that that was no longer to be considered bribery or political corruption. And instead, that was called free speech, that that money wasn't actually money. Those two Supreme Court decisions just opened a floodgate of cash into the GOP, which Reagan coasted on right into the White House. But the Democrats at that time, they said, eh, you know, we don't need to take that money because we got all this money coming from the unions because the unions were literally a wash in cash. One third of America had a union job. And so average people through their union dues were funding the Democratic Party and they were just fine with it because the Democratic Party was giving them back what they wanted with, you know, Social Security and Medicare and Medicare. And how many people are in a union today? Uh, less right, than six percent. Six percent of the American private workforce. Yeah, I mean, you know, this and 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 in fact, Reagan so effectively gutted the funding for the Democratic Party by cutting in half the union uh, movement in in just twelve years, in just his and, and Bush's administration, um, that Bill Clinton ha- and and Al Fromm had day. To, in you know, 80, 86, I think it was right around there. That's where yeah. they first. Yeah, and they decided, well, hey, listen, the unions don't have the money anymore. We'll get in bed with the big banks, and that was and that was all. That's true. right. They created this thing called the DLC to funnel money into the Democratic Party because the unions couldn't do it anymore. And they, th- but they thought we'll take good money, right? We'll take money from the banks and the insurance companies because that's white collar stuff. Nobody's getting killed by that like they do in oil and steel. We'll leave that to the Republicans. Yeah, how'd that work out? No, it's you know I always say when people, especially when people ask, what are my thoughts about third parties? I, I say I'd be happy with two because right now we don't have a labor party and that's, that is a huge problem. So if you can't have two corporate parties that are only really separated by a few social issues and yet are still taking money from the same people. Um, I mean, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, Did you hear what Biden right. said yesterday though about unions? No. He said he, he, he was doing a, a little riff about his build back better thing. And he said, and this time we're going to be damn sure I'm paraphrasing here, but we're going to be damn sure he was quite emphatic. We're going to be damn sure that it's union labor that rebuilds this country, not just labor. Well, said, I'd like oh, to see that. I haven't, heard, I haven't heard a president talk like that since Lyndon Johnson. You know what's going to allow us to do that? You know, those two trillion dollars in tax cuts said Trump got turn those $2 trillion around and give us an infrastructure bill based on clean energy jobs. I agree. And, and roll back George W. Bush's $2.5 trillion of the tax cuts and roll back Reagan's tax cuts and take us back to the 74% top tax bracket that you only hit after you make three, four, five million bucks a year. Take us back to that tax tax bracket that we had you know, for the first couple of years, for the first year of the Reagan administration, through Carter's administration, through Ford's administration, through Nixon's administration. Uh, you know, LBJ dropped it to 74% from 91%, which, you know, Jack Kennedy blew up the economy, grew the economy with Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican, loved that 90% top tax bracket, Harry Truman. I mean, you know, it, it's so ahistoric to say high taxes destroy the economy when the three uh, consecutive decades, the only three consecutive decades in the history of America where we had, you know, conse- annual GDP growth that was greater than 3% per year were the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It, it, to say, and, and the top tax rate was 90%. And yeah. then just in the last two years of that period, it was dropped down to 74%. But LBJ bragged about the fact that taxes on rich people went up when he dropped that tax because most of what he was doing was closing loopholes. And so the tax collections on rich people went up. Um, you know, and the supply setters will say, well, that's because he lowered the taxes. No, it's because he closed the loopholes. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm ranting again here, Edge. No, it, but it's a great ranter. We're speaking with Tom Hartman of the Tom Hartman Show. His book is The, his, the hidden, hidden History of the American Oligarchy. It's not so hidden anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not. No, but 
I, but it was a really good way to look at it, how it happens historically and not just look at it. Oh, right now we're in an oligarchy, just as if you people understand what that really means. I think it's important to look at the history, which we don't usually. Yeah. Do. And if, and if Trump wasn't, you know, and again, I, I always say, you know, we've always said that when it comes to Trump's, you know, I mean, obviously at the end of his term, his, his rhetoric got very dangerous, but for the most part, his rhetoric over the course of his presidency was completely incinerated. It's all about divide and conquer strategy. I always said that his position on the environment was unforgivable. That was the worst part of his presidency, the absolute destruction. And the fact that he was so callous about the virus, he just didn't care. It, it's not a question of whether he believed it was real or not. It's like, he just couldn't be bothered. He's like, I totally want to be golfing oh the entire God, time. That's all I yourself. really care he about. And it's yourself. true. And I can only imagine what it would be like, you know, being in DC, you know, for the people who really cared and are trying to get stuff done. And here you have a commander in chief who, you know, basically just wants to be campaigning. He just wants to literally be a dictator. You know, he wants people to kiss the ring and admire him and whatnot. And, you know, I can imagine that the destruction that he did do over the course of that time was pretty significant. We were just talking about this before he came on the air. Um, we're both convinced, obviously, that you know the GOP is not going to convict him. But do you think there is any kind of a scenario where some type of a backroom deal may be made where he simply does not run again? What do you think ultimately will be the outcome of this circus that is uh, the Trump circus, if you will? Well, even if he's not convicted by the Senate, and I, there's a caveat to that, um, he can still be convicted for violating the, the 14th Amendment. I believe it's the 14th and not the 15th. It is, and they only need, and they need less votes. That's right. It would take, yeah, I believe it would take 51 votes. Um, or or it, it may have to be done at the Supreme Court. I, I mean, there's a debate about exactly how that gets played out. Um, but uh, one way, what's interesting is Article, uh, Article 3, Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution, which outlines the... Uh, the power to impeach says that you know there's a hundred senators right now. It doesn't say that the major that that it requires a two thirds majority of all the elected senators. It says it requires a two thirds majority of the senators present. That's exact language of this of the members present is the language from the Constitution. So if a dozen or so Republicans who are not pro-Trump like Ted Cruz and not anti-Trump like Mitt Romney, but kind of in, in that middle area, were simply to get the flu the day of the vote and not show up, their colleagues joined with the Democrats might well be able to convict Trump. That's or very Trump. optimistic, I think. I, I don't know. I think that yeah. I just, I, I, I wouldn't have a lot of hope. I would, <laughs> we're, I full of, we're full of optimism, but we also know that this is a very unique time in history. Um, mm -hmm. The amount of people who are suffering right now, you know, yeah, obviously there were a lot of very uh, volatile people who stormed the castle, if you will, but there was probably an excess of a hundred thousand people who showed up in DC. Maybe a thousand of them attempted to get inside. As I like to tell the story, you know, Jen and I actually did go to Trump's rally in Sunrise in in Trump we land. We went if to you a will. Trump rally, and I can. You know, yeah. yeah, and I can tell you that the the people that they put on TV, the Confederate flag waving, you know, Southern pride crazies, if you will, five to ten percent of the audience. That's how much it is. The other 90, 95 percent of people who are there are everyday people like you and I, and that's the that's the speakers. I think you've got a lot of people who are just really tired of, I, I said this many times, as much as people dislike Trump, they dislike DC politicians even more. Well, that's that. See, that's where Trump was was politically and strategically brilliant. Is I, yeah. I believe he was the first Republican uh, person running for president who realized that America has become an oligarchy, that oligarchies are unstable, and if we're not careful, this oligarchy is going to disintegrate, and the Democrats are going to take it back. I'm small D Democrats, and and it's ripe to be turned into a police state. Because, I mean, he's following Orban's playbook. He's following Putin's playbook. He's following Hitler's playbook. He's, I mean, it's, this is not a secret, <laughs> you know, how to do this. Right? It's happened over and over again. One thing I did want to mention, you said, um, if, I, if I may, uh, about the virus. Uh, I, I wrote about this over at medium.com. Um, April 7th, we have to remember April 7th. This was a 
critical, critical turning point that is almost never discussed, at, at least in, in, in the white community, in, in, in uh, uh, urban, on urban radio and black radio, you will hear this discussed frequently. And most white people I know are completely unaware of this. In March, throughout the end, throughout March and and uh, the first week of April, Jared Kushner and a bunch of guys they had this whole little committee they'd put together. They were going to do something. They were going to do something about the virus. They were working on a on a uh, an order to a production order to increase masks and PPE. They were they were ordering stuff from all around the world. The post office had a plan on the books. They'd already been, put in the uh, request for proposals and the initial purchase orders to send five masks to every family in America. I mean, they were moving. And suddenly on April 7th, the headline at the top of the New York Times and at the top of the Washington Post and the story that led NBC, ABC, CBS, MSNBC and CNN and Fox was that a new study was just published finding that while black people are less than 20% of the population, they're more than 40% of the deaths. And at that moment, in the Trump White House, within one week, they did a complete 180. Oh, it's just black people dying? And mostly in, and exclusively in blue states? And that I believe, and I, and I, in my article, I document all the links and, and this, the exact same thing happened on conservative media. Rush Limbaugh made a 180 that week, as did all of the other right-wingers on radio. Prior to April 7th, they were like, oh, there's something going on. We need to pay attention to this. Uh, let's not get crazy about it. But uh, this is after April 7th, this is just like the flu. I, I, I don't think most people realize uh, how deep racial animus is in the white supremacist Republican Party. But it's there and it's huge. Yeah. And that is why I believe um, the only person who can salvage the Republican party. Cause I do think that both parties are going through a transitional period right yes. now, but I definitely believe that the person who will carry Trump's mantle, if given the opportunity is Rick Scott. I don't think there is anybody who is more capable. I think he has all the credentials to do it. He basically runs Florida, former governor, current U S Senator, uh, exceptionally wealthy and exceptional criminal. I might add, uh, he yeah, the largest is Medicare uh, scam in the history of the world. Yes. Fifth, Fifth Amendment, 75 times. And yet he is, I, I, I don't know Voldemort. how to describe he I is, call him Voldemort. But he is, yeah. Tom, you've been following politics for five decades, maybe more. He is a phenomenal politician. He really is. He is. And yeah. No, I agree. I absolutely agree. Got, he wouldn't be where he is if he wasn't. I remember when he gave his victory speech uh, back in 2018, and I just thought that's why he wins, because he just yeah. knows how to do it. And He's he gives, got the Oxox thing down, too. He's got, he's got, he can shed the tear. Ugh. He can talk about his mother. He can speak in Spanish fluently, yeah. like really well. It's a big and deal. And it, it's just, mm. again, I, you can see this, like you see it coming before it actually happens. Like, you know, the, where the democratic establishment mm. is trying to position their chess pieces on the board right now between, you know, obviously Kamala and Buttigieg. It's like, you, you just know after a while, you kind of get hip to the game. I just hope enough people are getting hip to it to recognize that necessary change is coming, but it's got to come from the right people. And so I do want to throw a little wrinkle in because she's obviously the person that we think is the leader of the progressive movement. How important is it to get Nina Turner into the United States Congress? I think it's really important. Uh, Nina, uh, I, I know Nina, you know, Louise and I have had uh, meals with her and her husband. He, she's spectacular. She's uh I, you know, there are not enough superlatives. She's she's solid. She's smart. She has legislative experience. She she, uh, you know, she worked her way up in the in the Ohio legislature, um, you know, but but let's not also let's not uh, succumb to savior complex, you know, to, right. to this idea that one person is going to save us. Um, we have to all of us have to get active inside the Democratic Party and turn this thing around. And people whose politics, you know, who, uh, people who, who are, who have the political skill set, who have the ability to give a public speech, who, you know, who would like that kind of work. I, you know, I would, I would, it would make me crazy. I can't, I could never be a politician, but there are some people who like that. And those people who are progressive need to be running for office. Um, school board, town council, a county clerk, um, state representative and ultimately U.S. Congress, and uh, you know we need to 
We need to be building this thing right across the board. And Nina is a great part of that. And she's a huge advocate for that too. She's a real grassroots up person. Yeah, she's one of those people that I know would um, step out and support somebody who's challenging an incumbent uh, yeah. when yeah. when no one else does. You know, somebody who will yeah, say, "Yeah, I know." I, 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 that is something that I think we really need: are people that are willing to really speak up once they're in power to help other people get into that position. And I mean, that's something that I noticed as a candidate is how few people that are willing to actually put their neck out, even though they support you behind the scenes. And that's a problem. You know, that's a big problem. And that's a problem I have with the Democratic Party in general, is how they treat democracy within their own um, sandbox, because, you know, they're not very democratic when it comes to primaries. Yeah. And that and that's a big problem. And that, I think, is a big turnoff to a lot of people. And it has pushed a lot of people outside of the Democratic Party and into this whole sphere of whether it's People's Party, the Green Party. And that's where the left is going because the Democrats have moved so far to the right. And that's well, and that's part of the country you're talking about. But, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. And, and that's but, you know, the thing that I think some people miss is that a, a, a political party is not really supposed to be a democracy. A, a political party is a club. And if enough of us, and, and, and this is the amazing thing, you know, if, 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 if I was to tell you, hey, we could take over NBC, all we have to do is get enough people to show up, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation, and we can literally take over management of it and program the network however we want. It would be like, whoa, how do I do that? Well, here's this multi-billion dollar corporation called the Democratic Party that's capable of passing legislation from the federal level all the way down to, to you know, your zoning, your local county. And it's wide open. The doors are open. You can just walk in and take it over. And because it's a club and not a democracy, I mean, yeah, they'll vote on things and, you know, majority is supposed to rule. But really, because it's a club, the people who are who represent the majority within the club are pretty much going to take it over and they're pretty much going to push out the people who disagree with them. And with the rise of Clinton in, in the 90s, the Democratic Party started shedding the, the LBJ progressives and the and the anti-war movement as well uh, that I was part of. And and began, you know, embracing uh, Jamie Dimon type banking fat cats. Now the Democratic Party, and this has been going on for a decade slowly, but I'd say in the last four years, it's really sped up. And Bernie Sanders is probably the main reason. Although in this last cycle, you could add Elizabeth Warren to that mix, which means now, hey, it's getting more diverse. It's getting more, uh, you know, the, the base is even broader. We have two progressive political candidates for president. That's a huge thing inside the Democratic Party. Um, it, it wouldn't have happened in 92. It wouldn't have happened in 96. It wouldn't have happened in 2000. Um, I, frankly, I don't think it would have happened until maybe 20, 2012. So if we can get enough of us inside and take over, it'll be a hell of a lot easier than trying to build an external party from the ground up. And history shows that because we don't have proportional representation in the United States, we're one of only seven democracies in the world that doesn't have proportional representation. Um, therefore, whenever, as a consequence of that, whenever a third party arises, it always takes a bite out of the party that it's closest to philosophically. And, you know, that that can be a very <laughs> suicidal thing to do politically. I definitely agree with what you're saying. And we're, again, we're speaking with Tom Hartman of the Tom Hartman Show. His book is The Hidden History of the All American of Oligarchy. American Oligarchy. Definitely check it out. I can't agree with you more because, as you know, and you follow politics as closely as anybody, you know, Wasserman Schultz pretty much embodies the worst of the Democratic Party. But aside from, obviously, her propensity to just completely sell out to corporate special interests, 90% of her campaign finance comes from, obviously, uh, oligarchic uh, contributors, if you will. The people who are in control of the Broward County Democratic Party are very much the ones who protect her, if you will. Uh, sure. They've been with her for 30 years. It's a club. I'm telling you. It's, it's but a club. Are, but you're so right when you say that there are so many open spots. Yeah. There are so 
many opportunities to get involved. I know the tendency is to say, well, the nice shiny object over there is the People's Party or the Green Party. But the truth of the matter is the Democratic Party could be taken over. People just have to be willing to put in the work. One of the reasons the GOP gets away with what they get away with is because that party and the people in it, they put in the work. They are on the school board. They are in the state house legislature. I mean, just look at Florida alone, and you can see that they cover all their bases. And for whatever and, reason- and, and this was not an accident, if, if I may. Um, yeah. in, in 2008, or uh, uh, actually it was in 2009, when, when Obama won that election, as I recall, this, this stuff still lives over on YouTube. You can find it. This group- that I'd never heard of before. And I, I was in, you know, in like the fourth or fifth year of my, uh, of my radio show. Um, it's, it's got Concord in its name. It's not Concord Coalition, but it's something like that, the Concord Coalition kind of thing. Um, this group started passing out, distributing DVDs and, uh, and, 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 and uh, letters and, and uh, just all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, on how to become a precinct committee person. And there's this incredible video that you can see of what they were passing out back then. And they were, and it was going to hundreds of thousands of Republican, um, you know, registered voters and people who had been even minorly active in the Republican party. And this guy is just looking at the camera and he says, you think the most powerful political position in the United States is president of the United States. That's not true. The most powerful political position in the United States is committee chairperson. Uh, or yeah. And, and uh, I, I mean, this is, and, and just, you know, went through this whole explanation about how if you can get on on these, you know, in inside the party, if you can get inside the Republican Party and this this is going to Tea Party activists, if you can get inside the Republican Party, we can take it over. And once we take it over, it'll be our party. And they did it. They pulled it off. Precinct committee and, person, excuse me. I, and I was, Tom, how, how long did it take? I mean, think about it. It took maybe, I, I guess, the team about a decade. Yeah, it started to form, I guess, in the latter years of the Bush administration, around like 2006, maybe 2000, somewhere around there. Yeah, and this I, big campaign was rolled out right after they, you know, right after Obama won, as I recall. Yeah, and then it really took off. I mean, think about it. Ted Cruz is as Tea Party as it gets, and he came. <sighs> he, he's number. He was number two. Uh, uh, granted, I think Ted Cruz is really. Hurt, hurt himself politically. And I do think it's going it, to, it will ultimately cost him in the long run. But to think that he got that close, knowing that their ideology is so unbelievably flawed, you know, it had some, I mean, there were merits to the Tea Party movement initially, but then the Koch brothers got their hands in it. And that's one of the things that, you know, I do want to- Hence talk, the oligarchy. Hence the oligarchy. And I think that's a good place for us to sort of wind down the conversation is it seems that a lot of these political movements, um, obviously the one that I would say is very strong down here in South Florida is the Sunrise Movement, particularly Sunrise Miami. Mm -hmm. They have a very solid group, but unfortunately, as we've seen, our revolution is a good example of that and some others in between. A lot of them ended up getting co-opted by the establishment. And I think the because we're in such an oligarchic state right now and because there's so few that control so much, it's so easy to get co-opted. How do we avoid that if we're going to build a sustainable movement when it's so tempting to give in? We, have to, we just have to reverse the flow. Um, instead of us sitting back and taking money or expertise or talent or, or time or resources from the established uh, the, from the establishment, as it were, um, instead we need to get them. We need to get inside the establishment and take it over from within. I mean, this is what I'm talking about here is stuff that in in some countries this kind of conversation gets you put in jail. We're talking about getting inside a political party and taking it over. And and this is what the this is what the Tea Party guys and the right wingers did with the Republican Party, you know, a decade or two ago. And it's what progressives um, did with the Democratic Party in the 1930s. This was what FDR did. Um, political parties swing back and forth constantly. They're they're very, very uh, uh, squishy things. <laughs> I'm lacking a word there. I, fungible oh, came to mind, but it's the wrong word. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, just reverse the flow. Uh, you know, if, if you're if you've got an independent organization, instead of looking to the Democratic Party for resources, try to figure out a way how your organization can become a force inside the Democratic Party that they can need you, that they can that that, that you can you know um, push them rather than being pushed by them.
Yeah, I agree. And I think that one of the things we have here in Florida that's really upsetting to progressives is that our state party is largely financed by Walmart and Big Sugar. Right. And this this is a big problem, especially for candidates and even certain people that are in office. I don't know how they do it, but for to be running on a, a platform of getting the corporate money out while running as a member of a political party that is at the behest of those exact corporations, it's it's a certain sort of cognitive disconnect that as a progressive running within the Democratic Party, we have to come to terms with. Well, and in those... In those it, I'm sorry, finish your thought. No, I was just going to say it's it's very, very difficult as a progressive because I wouldn't take corporate money, but yet I'm running within a party that takes corporate money. And so mm -hmm. there, it's, it's not that I'm personally hypocritical because I don't give them money. So, you know, but it, it's, it's seen that way. It, there's a very negative connotation amongst the left to be affiliated with a party that's corporate owned. Right. Well, you know, and, and some people are cynical about government too, but you know, we all agree that we should run for government. We should say, I mean, we were talking just a minute ago about how important it is to get Nina Turner into Congress. Yes. Um, yes. You know, I, I would say, you know, getting a majority of progressives in control of the Democratic Party in Florida is equally important. In fact, probably more important. Um, one of the things that that Concord group was telling the Tea Partiers about how to take over the Republican Party um, in one of their videos, the guy was talking about, don't go in like you're some kind of radical. Don't go in like you're some kind of revolutionary. Don't go in like you're going to you're telling them that you're going to try and change the party. Just go in, you know. Take your place, get a lot of your friends in, and eventually you'll hit a critical mass. And then it's just up to the vote. You you just take it over. And you know that's thinking strategically rather than reactively. Um, I don't. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with Florida politics. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't. Think you, I don't think you'll want to be. No. It's, I, one thing I could well, say. Well, you know, the Democratic Party in Oregon has got its own problems too. Although um, there's a really strong progressive coalition here. Yes, yeah, you and do. listen, you know, Merkley's a great senator. Blumenthal's a very good congressman. You've definitely got some good people. There's no question yeah. about that. But unfortunately, in our state, we, we don't. don't have any good people. Yeah. Zero. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate. We do have a young lady by the name of Ann Escamani, who I do believe is going to run for governor. And I think she's very good. And she's in the state house, uh, puts forth really good legislation. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, the, the uh, Democratic primary. Uh, DeSantis is going to be a very tough nut to crack. But- I do think he's. I do think he's vulnerable. I do, and he's also a jerk. And I think um, if you get the right person to run against him, especially one with no baggage and one that has the populist left, because let's face it, despite all his baggage, Gillum did have a very. He he ran right into the progressive lane, and especially in a multi-way race, that works. And he got oh, the nomination. What happened with the minimum wage down there? Yeah. yeah. They and and again, a lot Tell of me the Florida isn't progressive. Well, think about it. I actually working, think, working labor. Right. Labor, right. Not, that's right. that's but, why you all need to take over the damn Democratic Party in Florida. The problem is a lot of those people are independents and reds because they're working class they're people not, and they're just Tom, you you hit the nail right on the head. Being strategic is not the easiest thing to do when people and it are, takes years. It does. It does. And a lot of people don't have years and that's the way they look at it. But that's okay. why it's on us. That's why we're trying to build here in South Florida, the progressive movement, because I really do believe Florida is ground zero for an economic populist uprising. This state is driven by tourism and hospitality. It is literally ground zero for this. And that is why it leans so hard into Trump. The one, there's a lot of things we can look back on, you know, what Bernie did in both runs where he obviously made mistakes, but he never attempted to push the vote here in Florida for whatever reason. He may have just thought it was a lost cause, especially in South Florida. Uh, but with that said, not only did they vote convincingly for Trump this time, even more so than 2016, but we did pass a $15 minimum at wage. the same time. Yep. And we almost passed jungle primary vote in Florida, which means that I think Florida is also ground zero to get ranked choice voting passed. So there's yeah. definitely the, the opportunity is here and I'm in it for the long haul. I'd like to think my friend here is definitely in it for the long haul as well. We'll see what ultimately happens in 2022. But what's more important, like you said, you know, even if Jen were to run again, and even if she were to beat Wasserman Schultz, if you don't have 
the infrastructure on the ground to change the narrative, it's not going to mean much because this is already a blue district. And while we could definitely provide a much better living situation for tons of people here that Jen could do that Debbie obviously wouldn't do, that's not going to change the overall prospect of the way politics is done in the state and the country. And that's something that we are working towards. Um, and let's not forget, you talk about all the people in Florida who voted for Donald Trump, and you're absolutely right. Um, Donald Trump's principal uh, platform, the things that he ran on, he stole from Bernie. He was lying through his teeth, but he stole oh, yes. them from Bernie. He said, I'm going to raise taxes on rich people so bad their ears are going to bleed. He said, my rich friends hate me already. He said, I'm going to I'm going to get killed by this thing. I'm going to raise taxes so high on rich people. That got him a lot of votes. He said, I'm going to give everybody in America health care. It's going to be better than Obamacare. It's going to be cheaper than Obamacare. I know how to do it. The Democrats don't know how to do it. That's that's, you know, Bernie. He, he, he stole Bernie. Um, he said, I'm going to clean up the corruption in Washington, D.C. I'm going to end the oligarchy. This government is going to start doing what the people want, not what the billionaires want. I mean, th this is like he, he was again, he was lying through his teeth in all cases. No, he ran as a populist. Yeah. He ran as yeah. a populist. He ran pro-labor, exactly. ran anti-war. He he definitely ran as a populist, yeah, but he old, delivered on nothing. No, he delivered one thing. And ironically, he delivered it Half on the Half a wall, a no, broken wall. He delivered it on the Tax second day. Well, no, let's be fair. He did deliver one thing. He did ax the TPP. And that you got, and, and again, that's to me why he got elected because that's what won him the Rust Belt. Oh, and, and that was the other piece of it. And that was Bernie's platform. Absolutely. Yeah. 1000%. So the, the, the tools are there. The, the, the playbook is there. Like you said, you know, the Eugene Debs, you know, uh, Wallace playbook, it's all there. You just got to know how to execute it. And the only president in our history that I think ever really executed it was not FDR. It was Teddy Roosevelt. He, to me, is our best president. And there are many reasons that I would go through that. He's the only person who ever really challenged the oligarchy when the oligarchy had power. FDR was very fortunate that when he took power, the country was in, sh was in shambles. And we could have went one of two directions. We could have went the way of fascism, which is the way Nazi Germany ended up going, or we could go the way of democratic populism, socialism, if you will, which is what we ended up doing back in the 30s. And then of course we saw how it swung in the complete opposite direction in 1980. Now it's time to swing it back. Now's our time. Now's our time to make that change. And the last uh, thing that I wanna mention before we depart is the little story that I wanted to share. You know, when I, I went to college, I've always been in, interested in politics. I never thought I would make a career out of it, or at least work in it in some capacity. And when I heard about Bernie running for president, I thought, is there finally going to be somebody who's actually going to do it the right way? And when Bernie said he will do it with no corporate special interest money, I said, that's it. This is the one. I never thought I would be interested. I, you know, I, I voted for Obama, but I knew right away, you know, especially with Geithner and Diamond that, yep, just, just like anybody else. And Bernie was persona non grata from the very, very beginning. And I ended up calling into your show because Chris Saliza decided to write a very incendiary article about Bernie by suggesting that Bernie will win and could win Iowa and New Hampshire and Hillary is still going to crush him after the fact. And I'm just thinking, who writes like this? Mm -hmm. And eventually I started to learn by having a conversation with you about how this is how it works in D.C. Either you're inside or outside. And if you're inside, you don't want anything to do with somebody like Bernie Sanders because he is dangerous to the, to the life that a lot of these people live. That's why so many people are disinterested with the Washington Post and the New York Times and MSNBC and CNN. And you just crystallized it for me. And I want to thank you for that because that was really, you know, I started watching you, uh, you know, obviously on the big picture. I don't know how you dealt with some of your guests, especially somebody like Horace Cooper. But Are you expecting him to remember your phone call? No. Okay. I'm just checking. He might. You I never know. But, you know, we've I'm had, sure it was very memorable for him. Look, we had, you know, we had yeah, Alex Lawson. Awesome. Yeah, we had Alex Lawson on the show. He, you know, talk about somebody who really knows Social Security inside and out. You know, oh, we've yeah. had conversations with Ari Riebenhoff. I learned so much from, you know, what you were putting forward. And he's know, a fan. That's what no, he's saying. I he's a fan. I respect um, for what he fights for because it, you know. So, so how do we make Jen governor? I don't know if we uh, want to make Jen no, no, governor. No, 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 no. 
Um, I think the well, while I think I'm not running, I won't run for a statewide office. The only thing that she'll I, I run just, for, I don't have it yet. in me to run for a statewide yeah. office. I just yeah. don't. I, 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 but but I do think that if look, if Jen is going to run again against Debbie, the only way we can do that is if we absolutely do not have to worry about fundraising. That's a big one. Um, and right yeah. now, you know, we can't, you can't rush into a decision like this. You know, a lot of people are already thinking about, oh, I'm going to jump in for 22. We're not deciding we yet. We have a pandemic that is still raging in this state. I don't know about you, but I don't know how you can win a race, a congressional race. You no can't less. canvas. If you can't canvas, if you can't knock on doors, if they won't. There's no buildings, events. Yeah. You're that, kinda, to run a grassroots campaign without a ground game, is is just not something that is very um, feasible because what we don't have in money, we make up for in a ground game. But right. if you can't have events and be able to have things, you've got no ground game. So and, and, that's difficult. And I don't want to get conspiratorial, but I don't put anything past Trump's, you know, little soldier, Ron DeSantis. Oh. I can almost, you can almost make the argument that he is going to delay dealing with this virus until he believes it's safe that he's going to win re-election. Well, like to subvert the campaigning. Thousand it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, yeah, it wouldn't. Trump's strategy. Me. Yeah. Well, I mean, would you agree? I would not put anything past DeSantis. No. Because he's just got that in him to just, you know, whatever it's going to take for him to get his second term, he's going to do that. And that's, you know, de de dealing with this virus in such a putrid way to the point where Biden is now talking about a federal travel ban on the state of Florida. Oh, my God. As if our state didn't de have enough Look, to deal with. We are Florida. For a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's power, not policy, uh, apparently, with DeSantis. It, you know what? Well, look, he's mini Trump. He was essentially put there by Trump. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and so it is what it is. And, and honestly, I don't look, I'd love to see Anna Eskamani get that. And I, it would be very pleasing to me. I I'm skeptical, but, um, yeah, I, I'm going to stay within my little, my little micro habitat, my little district. It's, it's big enough yeah. and it can be commuted. You know, it's easy. It's yeah. I will say this, uh, Debbie still runs the show. She had a heavy hand. She's very close with Bloomberg and had a lot to do with the current, person who is in charge of the state party. Um, but she is the head of the snake. And if Debbie goes, a lot of things will change in the state of Florida. Yeah. I know some people think that's hyperbolic. No, here I've will be, been, be a big difference. Yeah, I've been in I've been in this game down here long enough to know that yeah, all roads lead to her. And because yeah, she, she ran the DNC, she knows how to be a party boss. If you and oh, and yeah. that's the other thing, you know, this doesn't get talked about enough. She was the head of the DNC for six years as an elected representative. You're really not supposed to be. That's why you got you had Tom Perez. We can talk all we no, want about how no, bad they we're are. Not going but there. Tom Perez, Jamie Harrison, these are not elected officials. The fact that she was an elected official who had every intention of becoming Secretary of State in the Clinton administration and would have done anything to make sure that no one got in her way. And they didn't see Bernie coming at all. They really didn't. And yeah. when he won the Michigan primary, it was almost like they didn't have any choice. They were basically like, all right, look, we just, if, if this has to be out in, in the open, oh, okay, they didn't even so care. be it. Just kneecap At that him. point, it's like, okay, we got to do what we got to do. Take him out. Because we got plans, baby. But I we're remember. eventually, <laughs> eventually things, you know, eventually the tide turns. And before you go, I must uh, give um, Tom my uh, my impression because Lord uh oh here it goes it. all right do you need do you need your do you need your thing all right you got this is part of the shtick it usually doesn't happen till the end of the show but okay all right. tom no. i just want to thank you for all that you've done over the years i am very grateful for you always having me on your show it's always a pleasure and i certainly want you to continue doing what you're doing i know that i am not exactly popular in dc but as the head of the senate budget committee we are going to get some good things done for the american people <laughs> Now, if we could just get them their damn stimulus checks. Jen? Uh, we're working I'm, on it, I'm Bernie. working as hard as I can. We're working on it. But that we're doing the best. brilliant. I've so never seen such a good Bernie. It's good, right? Good. The mask yeah. isn't good, but the voice is good. Like, the mask oh, yeah. is not He's ideal. He's got yeah. the voice. Yeah. That's just incredible. And the accent. And the gestures, too. He's good. If yeah. you haven't heard the hidden history of the American oligarchy, you're going to have to read Tom Horton's book. I really recommend it. It's very good. You can get it on. I don't recommend Amazon, but unfortunately, that's where it's sold. So you're going to have to do what you have to do. It's a great book. <laughs> they're unionizing. Yeah. Oh, they're unionizing. That's right. I support the unionization of Besma, Alabama, Amazon warehouse workers. 
And if they unionize, <laughs> we are going to change how labor is done in the United States. And don't forget, oh my when God. Reagan was elected president, <laughs> I was elected mayor of Burlington. Isn't that amazing? It's a very interesting coincidence. That's a great story. That's a great story. Yeah. All yeah. right. All right. This is so Jason that is Barber. so that's me, and that's for you because I normally do it at that's the end great. of the show. But oh, you'll bring I've it got... back. He'll put it back on. He's got <laughs> others. Any, He's got uh, others. We're happy to Bernie. What a talent. Well, we certainly hope that if you guys haven't read the book yet, highly recommend it. Tom, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Obviously, we hope to see you again. We hope you'll have Jen on at some point. Look, which would be, look, which would be I, it's, look, it's controversial. I get it. It's very sensitive. It's kind of like walking on eggshells, but we don't even know what we're doing yet anyway. But No, we have to continue to build name recognition regardless. That's the name of the game. I'm all about you know? educating people and trans we're about transforming politics into service. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. And and sort of putting out there this paradigm of what campaigns should be. Whether or not you win, if you have a campaign of service and education, you're pushing the needle. You're making a difference. You're you're it's all part of the progress, whether you win or not. And that's what we're that's what we're that's what we're about. That's yeah. essential to get that. And so many people don't get it. It's essential. You're absolutely that's what right. we're doing. Like you say, democracy begins with you. Get out <laughs> and get active. Tag you're it. And that's what we're going to do. Tag, it. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it so much. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. See you soon. What a great guy. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.